Erythritol is a zero calorie, sugar-free sweetener that's used in all sorts of low carb diet drinks and food products. Now, while I'm not a huge fan of people overindulging these zero calorie sweeteners, I also think the media coverage and this study is grossly mischaracterizing the findings. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that. The title of the study here is the Artificial Sweetener Erythritol and Cardiovascular Event Risk. It's important to recognize that this study had two different arms of it. The first arm, which was a longitudinal association between elevated elevated blood levels of erythritol and cardiovascular related events over a three year period of time. They had study subjects at Cleveland Clinic, I think 800 or 1000. And another subset or cohort was in Europe. And essentially what they found is that blood levels of erythritol were independently associated with a higher risk for having a future cardiovascular related event over the course of the study. But that doesn't tell the whole story because erythritol can be ingested exogenously. You could have it in sugar free drinks or sugar free cookies, for example, that are sweetened with erythritol. But there's also a biochemical pathway known as the pentose phosphate pathway wherein glucose and fructose can be converted into erythritol. Now, this is mostly characterized, at least previously published studies have shown, that this pentose phosphate pathway is upregulated in obesity and metabolic disease. So you have this association in the blood where there's higher levels of erythritol are linked with an increased risk for having a cardiovascular event. But that is not, they weren't tracking dietary exogenous erythritol consumption. So it's important to disentangle these two phenomena because the erythritol could be likened to the smoke, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the fire. And often in disease states, there is an increased level due to adaptive changes in the body, for example, with cholesterol or lipids like triglycerides or liver enzymes or uh, clotting factors and so forth. But sometimes these are compensatory mechanisms in the body. And it turns out that when people are eating high levels of hyperpalatable, ultra processed foods, the body tries to get rid of glucose and converting it uh, into other forms, for example, into de novo lipogenesis, into fats, because you can store more body fat and they don't have the same glucotoxicity. Although there is at a certain threshold lipotoxicity in the context of insulin resistance. And it could be that the body is using various mechanisms to decrease blood glucose in the context of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and obesity, and therefore is converting both glucose and fructose into erythritol. And that's what other studies have actually shown. So the study wasn't designed to test for erythritol consumption and the association with heart disease and cardiovascular events like clots and strokes. It just correlated and made an association with blood levels of erythritol and outcomes when it comes to cardiovascular events. Now, that's, I think, an important limiting factor is it's not disentangling exogenous consumption from low-carb and erythritol-sweetened foods and beverages from endogenous production of erythritol derived from glucose and fructose. Now, there was a second part of the study only involving eight subjects over the course of 30 days, or actually this was just seven days, eight subjects over the course of a week, they ate 30 grams of erythritol per day which I think is quite a high dose. That would probably in involve you having an entire box of low carb cookies uh, sweetened with erythritol to get that dose, which no one is recommending that you eat a whole box of low carb cookies or an entire you know, carton of low carb ice cream that might have 30 grams of erythritol per day. That being said, they did show an association with erythritol consumption and increased blood levels of erythritol. Now, that doesn't mean there was no other biomarkers. They didn't look at fibrinogen. They didn't look at clotting cascades. They didn't look at endothelial dysfunction. They didn't look at troponin. They didn't look at any other proxies of cardiovascular risk. They just said, hey, when people eat erythritol, their blood levels increase. So therefore, this confirms the findings of our longitudinal study that did show an association with high blood levels of erythritol and cardiovascular events. But again, I think this is myopic and, and limited insofar as we... The, that seven-day study did not look at any other markers of cardiovascular disease outside of an elevated blood level of erythritol. So it goes back to understanding what other studies have found, and that is that I, what I mentioned earlier, the fact that in insulin-resistant metabolic disease states, there is a conversion of both glucose and fructose to erythritol. And so I think it's really important to disentangle. And I think this speaks to a broader issue of confusion for many people. 
And that is people think that non-nutritive sweeteners like monk fruit, like stevia, like xylitol, and now erythritol are somehow dangerous and are really problematic. Now, I do recommend consuming these zero calorie sweeteners in moderation. I don't recommend sucralose because that has been shown to have some problems. Also, aspartame has some challenges as well. Uh, as well as ACE K. So the three sweeteners that I generally recommend that are non-nutritive, that are zero calorie, yet offer a little bit of sweet taste in moderation are going to be stevia, monk fruit, and xylitol. And so I think it's important to recognize this study right here, the title of this recently published paper, and I think this will help clear up some of the confusion and concern about stevia and monk fruit. This paper here, Stevia beverages consumption prior to lunch reduces appetite and total energy intake without affecting glycemia or attenuation bias to food cues, a double-blind randomized control trial in healthy adults. And essentially what this trial found is preloading with a stevia sweetened beverage before lunch actually decreased post-meal glucose and did not have an effect on hyperpalatability or over-consuming foods. And this speaks to uh, the idea that just because something is sweet doesn't mean it's going to worsen your glucose and insulin dynamics in the post-meal window or cause you to over-consume food. And so the main finding of the study was a beneficial effect of consuming a stevia-sweetened beverage on reducing short-term appetite and total energy intake. And there was also a another meta-analysis here. The title of this is The Effect of Stevia Leaves on diabetes, a systematic review and meta-analysis of preclinical studies, essentially finding that consuming things like stevia, and there's other analysis on monk fruit, actually has a favorable effect on blood sugar control. And so we know that we can't really put all of these non-nutritive sweeteners in the same bucket because we know that sucralose and ACE-K and aspartame function differently than stevia and monk fruit, which are derived from natural compounds, the leaves of various uh, trees and, and uh, plants out in nature. And uh, this has been actually consumed in, in Latin America and South America for a long time and has medicinal properties. So we can't really put stevia in the same bucket as sucralose and we can't put monk fruit in the same bucket as ACE-K or aspartame. It, it's important that we disentangle these things, some of which are synthetically curated like sucralose or ACE-K, other compounds are naturally occurring, like xylitol, uh, also like, like stevia and monk fruit. So I think there's a lot of excessive focus on, will stevia break my fast? Will having monk fruit cause me to overindulge? The evidence shows no. And the evidence from this recently published study on erythritol shows that we can't really make broad sweeping, sweeping conclusions about what erythritol will do when it comes to cardiovascular risk event, because this study did not account for exogenous erythritol consumption. All they found was an association with high blood levels of erythritol and the increased odds of having a cardiovascular event. But we now know from other studies that have been published over the past 10 years that the body has compensatory mechanisms by increasing what's known as the pentose phosphate pathway, ripping glucose and fructose into converting it to erythritol. That could very well be a protective adaptive mechanism to lower hyperinsulinemic, hyperglycemic states when people have glycemic variability and, and blood sugar levels are all over the place because they're consuming excessive amounts of energy, excessive amounts of hyperpalatable ultra processed foods. So I just wanted to share this research with you and sort of clarify any confusion that you may have. Now, again, I don't suggest that you consume 100 grams of erythritol per day, but if it, I think it's a little bit better to have maybe an erythritol sweetened beverage compared to a full-blown soda pop, if that's the, the, the trade-off that we're going to do here, um, or have maybe one erythritol sweetened cookie or a couple bites of erythritol sweetened ice cream compared to ice cream that has a lot of sugar. So th those are my perspectives, everything in moderation, and we need to disentangle the fear associated with consuming a little bit of stevia or a little bit of monk fruit, for example, in dietary supplements or in uh, desserts and things like that from from sugar and other non-nutritive sweeteners so hopefully you found this helpful if you did please hit that like button let me know what you think about in the comments and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road have a great day bye